Okay. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm here with EdChat Interactive. And today, uh, this is an experiment because it's Sunday morning here in, in Eastern US. Uh, today, our first Sunday morning EdChat Interactive, and we have Lisa Parisi, who has uh, taught in public schools for, taught and administered in public schools for 35 years. and has written and has talked all over the US, probably even the world. And she's going to be talking about a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is teaching children um, to respect each other and and um, and to have empathy for each other. And um, so Lisa, uh, good morning. Maybe you can just describe how a little bit, you know, how you, why this topic is is key for you as well. Oh, that's such an interesting question because for like politically I can and world, you know, for what's going on in the world, I can certainly say why it's so important, but I've actually been working on respect my whole career. Um, I taught for 35 years. I've been retired for a year and, and I'm going into consulting and I've been writing books and, um, and I really started working on teaching empathy, I guess because I have like a special ed background. I've always been a gen ed teacher, but I have a special ed background. So I've always had like this affinity for those children that were in my class and not doing as well. And I wanted them to be accepted. And I wanted, I wanted the class to see how amazing how brilliant, how special they were. Um, mm -hmm. Regardless of their, their struggles. Hi, Santi, it's so good to see you here. And- um, Hi, Lisa. <laughs> um, welcome from India. Um, so, so I just, um, I think that, uh, that that really started me on this search for how to teach my children to be respectful of each other, to not um, make fun of those children that were struggling, to not make fun of the children that were different, the hearing impaired child or the, the child with CP or, or the spectrum child, whatever it was. And in that search, I found so many other tools and found that I could get my students to care more about each other, about the environment, about the, their schoolmates, about their, uh, the world, about the mm -hmm. world, um, just by teaching them to be more respectful of each other. So when we were talking earlier, one of the things that came up is that there's, you know, we use, there's, a, there's terms that we use uh, when we talk about respect and liking each other, like empathy, sympathy, acceptance, appreciation. Um, do you want to talk, and I, I guess I'll move on to the next slide, about the differences between those those terms? Okay. Um, or or I, actually, I guess the, the question before that is, why do we teach empathy, empathy? And then we can go into the differences between the terms. Okay, so... Uh, the slide that I created here really is about today, but I really think we have to teach em We, I taught empathy because of the population I worked with, but we have to teach empathy because we have to learn to be civil with each other. And civility is just disappearing quickly. Um, we, we need to, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just going to, Oh, I just want to open the chat and see if anyone's saying anything in here that I want to see. Um, if you have anything you want to say, just post it in the chat and we'll bring oh, it Oh yeah, I've, and I've um, to say, you can, um, you can post in the chat. Um, if, you want to, if you want to come up, um, let us know and you can come up and you can you know, ask a question verbally also. And I'm going to be keeping my eye on the chat also. So if, uh, if somebody has a question or a comment in the chat, I'll, I'll bring it up as well. Okay. Um, so I, I think it, I think empathy just covers so many character traits that are important in a society. 
um, we have to care about the world and, and that, is, that is being destroyed at an alarming rate right now. And we have to care about each other and about people who are dying from COVID or people who are being hurt by authority or, um, or the people in authority that are being attacked. Like it's time for us to start caring. And, and one of the things that we as educators know is that everything that, that, that we are creating the leaders of the future. You know, I used to tell my students that all the time, that I am teaching you to be the leaders. When they would say to me, well, why is it, why is the world like this? Why, why do you, have you let it happen? I'm like, okay, well, we've done a really lousy job. It's now your turn and, mm -hmm. and, and it's your job to improve things. And, and we, are, we are teaching the leaders of the world. So do we want them to be leaders of one select group or do we want them to be leaders of everybody? Do we want them to care about only one part of the world or do we want them to care about the whole world? Do we want them to care only about people who are as qualified as them, as good as them, as you know, what, wherever they see themselves or do we want them to care about everybody? And that's really what empathy is about. And I, I don't think, I think when we, when we try to convince other people of things, um, if we're coming at it from the point of view of opposition, then our chances of influencing somebody are practically nothing. So when we take a look at, let's say, somebody who's worked their whole lives as a factory worker, earning a good um, living, and they lose their job because their company outsourced their job to uh, somebody earning a lot less in another country, and then they become angry that they've lost their job and, and, and blaming, and then we call that person a deplorable. Our chances of ever convincing that person to open up their minds to other possibilities kinds of ends, right? So, you know, if we don't have empathy um, and are willing to walk in their shoes, we don't really have a chance of influencing other people and having them change. And I think part of it is that if we expect that we're just going to be influencing other people, we're not going to be successful either. We have to understand that if we're talking to other people and we want to influence them, we have to be willing to be influenced by them as well. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting. I remember the first time I ever worked with, um, with a class in, it was in Africa, actually, in a very, very poor area, in a very, very poor school. And I, and it was someone that I was connected with online, and he was the teacher there. And they, I mean, they worked, the, it was, they sat on the floor and, and wrote on the wall with, you know, chalk. And, um, and the only computer they had was his, he would bring it into school every day, hook up on his, um, however he got internet on his phone and then Skype with us. And one of the things I remember so clearly him saying to us in my class was that my students have a lot to offer. And it really opened my students' mind and mine because we at first were looking at them like, oh, and this really is like the difference between empathy and sympathy. We looked at them and said, oh, those poor people, they have nothing. Isn't that horrible? Um, and we felt bad for them. And in fact, yes, we could help them. And right away, my students were like, well, what can we do to help? And, you know, we, we had a fundraiser and we raised money and we sent them books and, we, you know, blah, 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 all this stuff. But but ultimately what we did is we worked with another teacher who started a site called the, a distance, it was a distance learning site where kids went on and made videos to teach. And so those children in those class, in that class who had nothing made videos about how to speak their language, about how to play their games. And we watched those videos and we learned from them. 
And, and then we posted videos about how to read and we posted videos about how to do math and we each and different teachers came in and took different subjects. And the whole point of that was for us to understand that these children who had so little had something to offer us. Mm -hmm. They had something to offer us. And, and we didn't see them as having anything to offer us when we first saw what their class was like. And it seems to me, looking at this slide of empathy versus sympathy, that's, that's one of the things that we also have to teach our kids is the difference between empathy and sympathy. Yes, absolutely. You know, sympathy is, oh, I feel so bad for you. I feel so bad for you. Uh, I did put, I, I found this, this um, image online, but I did put, notice I put, that's not my typo. I didn't put, I'm very big <laughs> on that. <laughs> that was in the slide already. Um, but the part on empathy where it says may have similar experience in the past, that's not necessary for feeling empathy. I've never lived in a poor area of Africa where I was going to school without desks and chairs, without school supplies. I've never done it. And yet I can empathize with those children and what they might need and still understand that they have so much to offer me that I can learn so much from them. And so when you're teaching empathy to your students, you need to, you know, like there's a, the whole thing about walking in others' shoes. My kids would always say, well, but I, but I, I, I can't, I don't understand that. I can't do that. You don't need to have that same experience in order to understand how mm -hmm. they might help. It's really just a matter of imagining what it would be like if, you know, like if I, me with my brain and my intelligence and my understanding of the world was put in that situation, I would be able to function. <laughs> and I'm looking and I see we have really, um, you know, experienced educators who are attending um, and yourself. So one of the things that, that comes to my mind is what are some exercises that we could do for kids that would help them start moving in this direction where they start understanding sympathy and understanding empathy and the, and the distinctions between them. Um, and I'm wondering if the educators who are here, if there's things that they want to put in the chat, if they want to come up and, and if they have ideas on how the, they might do it or have, the, have they have done it in the past, but Lisa, maybe first you. Okay. So I think that's an excellent question. Um, there is so much that can be done in a classroom to teach those skills, um, starting with literacy. Uh, mm -hmm. I was an elementary teacher, so I used books for everything. And, and you can actually say to children, you know, you might not have experienced this, but remember when we read that book where that character had that experience and remember how it felt for that character. Um, so you can turn, you can turn it over there. You can talk, I mean, I've talked about TV shows and cartoons and songs and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and pulling all of that out and getting them to understand. Um, it's also a matter of making, for me, making the teaching of empathy up, the utmost of importance in the classroom. So no matter what I was doing, that was always the goal. So it isn't necessarily a separate subject, although it could be, but if you're, if the, you're teaching, if you're reading a story, or if you're set social studies, you're studying something, you can weave it into your existing lessons. And it gets woven in constantly. If you could go to slide four, I think that's the very next slide, actually. Um, I have steps in here. Um, and I, I really just want to talk about CARES for a minute. Now, um, for those of you who have never heard of Responsive Classroom, I highly recommend it, highly recommend it. Um, their training happens to be very expensive, but they have some fabulous books. You can look at my blog. I've posted about some of them. Um, but they talk about CARES. And this was a bulletin board 
that I had a CARES bulletin board in my classroom. It stayed up all year. We referred to it all the time. At the beginning of the year, we broke down those five traits. Um, we read about them, we looked for them, we, we blogged about them, we, we, found, we watched TV thinking about them. But all of those, those five traits are, are implicit in every single thing we do. We were called the Denton Dynamos and we are the class that cares. And that was our bulletin board. We are the class that cares. And I would constantly remind my children when they weren't being caring that they are a class that cares and, and to remember what those things are. And empathy is centered, even though it's only one of the letters, it's only the E part, it's really part of everything, like even self-control. I love talking about self-control. We, we talk about self-control in classrooms and we never talk about it anywhere else in the, in, ever, ever. You never hear about self-control. The reality is self-control, as I used to tell my children, is only important when other people are around. When nobody's around, you can do whatever you want and nobody cares. So if you want to have a food fight in your kitchen- So, so you're saying that if- a man goes into the forest and no woman is around to hear him and he says something, he may not be wrong. <laughs> I didn't say he wasn't wrong. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody cares. Nobody mm -hmm. cares. You can, and I, and, and this is also part of what I would tell my students. You can think whatever you want in your head. I don't care what you think in your head. That's your head. You want to think in your head, you're the worst teacher on the planet go right ahead. You want to think in your head, I hate you, go right ahead. But, but your actions when I'm around matter a lot. Mm. And, and that's what self-control is all about. Self-control means thinking about the people around you. And that's what empathy is. Think Sorry. about the people I, around you. I didn't mean to advance this slide. So as I'm looking at cares, um, and I may have them wrong anyhow, but I, but I can understand cooperation, responsibility, empathy, and self-control. I'm not sure I understand what assertion means. Okay, so assertion, when, we, when I taught it, it was always the difference between assertion and aggression. Um, and women especially, and I know there are women in the, in the chat right now and, and in, the, in the listening to this, mm -hmm. women understand we're often called aggressive when we are asserting ourselves. And we have to learn that assertion has to do with empathy. It's like you were saying before, if I, if I say to you, you just lost your job and I, and I want, and I'm gonna give you another job and this is the job you're gonna do and you're gonna pay attention to me and stop complaining about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not being assertive. That's being aggressive. And what you need to do at that point is say, excuse me, and not yell at me and not complain to me, but just say, excuse me. Um, I think that you're not hearing what I'm saying. Let me try it again. I lost my job. I can't pay my bills. I don't know what to do about that. Um, and so assertion is really pushing your agenda or making yourself heard without hurting other people in the process. So I'm, as I'm, what's coming into my mind is that aggression is, you know, allows me to, is a way of letting people know what I want them to do. But assertion is a way of letting them know in a way that then results in collaboration because you're using empathy when you're being assertive. Yep, okay. Because I'm speaking my mind, but I'm not gonna put you down while I'm speaking my mind. Okay, and then I see on the left side, you have you know, model, 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 which is really what, the, what, you know, what it's calls for the teacher to do, right? Yes, and, and slide six. Okay, should I move on to slide five or? Well, let's just run to slide six because you talked about model, model, okay. model. So let's go to that. Um, slide six really talks about modeling. What are we doing? We, we contribute a lot 
to the lack of empathy in schools. And I'm going to tell you, I have done every one of these things that I'm going to talk about. I have made a comment or or listened to somebody talking in my class and sort of winked at someone else who was, you know, maybe it's a child who's struggling and has to ask that question for the hundredth time. And the, and the smarter child, the smarter child in the class is rolling her eyes because she doesn't want to listen to it again. And I kind of wink at her. Mm -hmm. That does not contribute to empathy. And I have done that. And I have thought that by doing that, I'm acknowledging that bright child who got it, got the topic much faster. What I was doing was saying, oh my God, we all have to put up with this dumb kid again. And I wasn't saying that, but that's absolutely what was going on when I kind of smiled at the child who was rolling her eyes or I winked or something like that. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to interrupt only because there was a really interesting comment from Anupam that, um, you know, she says, you know, understanding perspective can help a lot. As an example, she says, initiating discussion, like having the kids imagine rain and thinking of what comes to their minds and then getting a discussion. And it's probably, is pretty amazing that different things come to different kids' minds as they think about rain and what comes next, and that can trigger a discussion on perspective and, under, and, and empathy. And taking that then and bringing it into your lesson. So if you think about what I was just saying, you know, we're, mm -hmm. I'm doing a math lesson and the, the child who's struggling has asked a question for the hundredth time and everyone else is like getting annoyed with it. If we now talk about, what, why is there a difference in learning here? What was the same about our learning? Where did, we, where did we all keep up together? And then where did we split? Why did we split? One of the things I used to do when, um, when I would do problem solving is I would have children come up and, and record because I had a smart board and you can do recording on the smart board. Mm -hmm. I would record their ways of solving the problem. And so I would have kids come up and say, what was your way of solving it? What was your way of solving it? What was your way of solving it? And there were so many times when children would come up and solve a problem and we wouldn't get it. I don't understand what you're doing. I didn't, didn't, didn't understand that, didn't. And someone in the class would go, oh, now I get it. Now I get it. Because when I was describing it, they didn't understand it. When other kids were describing it, they didn't understand it. But this real strange way of solving a problem clicked with them. Hmm. And they get it. And, and that opens up everyone else's mind to say, oh, like different, there are different ways of doing this and different things we can accomplish if we just keep our minds open to each other. What is this? Interesting. Account? So now I'm looking at, um, well, actually I was, I, I just saw another comment, but I was looking at the two apples and maybe you can describe <laughs> the, the, okay. the two so, apples represent like, how are we contributing to the problem? So one of the hardest things for, one of the hardest things for me to do in the classroom was to, to relinquish control. I was in charge. I was the most important person in the classroom. I was the smartest person in the classroom. Everyone's going to listen to me. I had to let that go because it, it's fake. And when you are not being genuine, children know it. They know it. They get it. They, they, and they stop listening to you. And and we do it all the time. We do it all the time. Oh, Johnny, what a wonderful idea. This is so amazing. I'm sorry, kids don't believe that. Um, don't patronize them. Don't, don't lie to them. Be honest. You know, I would say to kids when they would come up to me and hand me work and I would look at it and say, really like this is, this is not acceptable in here. And they would say, well, but I, but I try, I, I couldn't do anymore. And I'd be like, well, let's sit down and try that again. 
and and let's and let me help you and what was holding you back instead of saying oh, what a wonderful job you've done i'm so proud of you now let's go fix it if you did a wonderful job why are we fixing it so as you're saying that i'm thinking how people i think misinterpret the growth mentality like when somebody <laughs> says something and they say it wrong that doesn't mean that you as the teacher really compliment the person for a, a you know a, a wrong idea or going or, or a wrong answer but um but on the other hand you know you want to encourage them to keep at it so right. so there's a a fine line and then i'm as i was thinking that i was looking at cheater paul's comment that um there's a lot of fine lines here and um you know the comment was a thought that is crossing my mind is about the fine balance needed to be assertive while maintaining self-control as well. It's a fine-tuned skill that would require a lot of practice to attain. So I'm thinking of that as like, well, that's a fine-tuned skill for us as teachers and adults. And it's a fine-tuned skill that we want to help our kids. So you know, thinking about it on two different levels. How do we help kids? Get so with those I think it's I think it's easier for children um, than it is for us. I think my students and and for me and responsive classroom believes this too but for me I think we have to start young and and early and by the time if we started early in preschool and in elementary school imagine what high school would be like I mean it would just be incredible but um students understand that if you're genuine then you can say to them, I, I don't think that you worked your hardest on this. And they'll, they'll, and they'll hear it and they'll listen. Mm -hmm. Where when I first started teaching, I thought I'm never gonna say that to a child. Like that's, you don't say that. You know, like I had children that I, that I actually would say, I know you're not telling me the truth. Where when I first started teaching, I was like, you don't call kids liars, but kids lie all the time. They'll, they'll lie all the time. And we right. always know it. We always know it. We know when they're lying. We roll our eyes. We give them that fake smile. And then it, it, it continues. And they think they got away with it or they're not sure or they just really hate you because you don't get it. I will or call an assertive, Yeah, whereas an assertive or genuine approach might be what? where we would say, I know that this is a hard thing for you. I mean, I'll give you an example. I had a child in my class once when I, I used, I used Edmodo. For those of you that don't know, Edmodo is um, an online chat room. That's a walled in garden. It's a walled in classroom where you have just a room. Your students are allowed in the room, then you can lock it down and they're the only ones in there and they have chats in there. I had set up Edmodo in a class and forgot to lock down the classroom. The day that I, like, usually as soon as they come in, I lock it down and I had forgotten to lock it down. That night, I get a message from one of my students that somebody is in Edmodo that they don't know. And he's called himself Psycho Killer. Now this is fifth grade, these are little children. And, um, and he was saying to them, um, you know, I'm here and don't tell your teacher or I will know if you tell her. And, you know, he was saying like some really scary things. I knew who it was. Um, I, I kicked him out because you can do that in Edmodo. We came in the next day and we had a meeting about it. I talked to the kids about you know, when someone's, when someone's online and you don't know who it is, you're not supposed to talk to them. And a lot of them were talking to him saying, you need to get out of here. Who are you? Why are you here? And I said, you know, the one child who contacted me, that was the correct thing to do was to say, um, you know, here it is. Mm -hmm. The child, and I knew who it was at the time, but I didn't, I, I, was, I was saying to the class, like, I know it's one of you, it, come talk to me about it. And he wouldn't, he was lying and lying and lying. And finally, I just called him on it and said, it was you. Um, and I, and here's the proof that I have. And I called in his father and the father convinced me against my better judgment to not tell the class. 
that it was him. Don't tell the class. He lost computer privileges and we didn't tell the class and the class was still really upset about it. Mm -hmm. And I had called him on it already. I had said to him, I know you're not telling the truth. And what he said to me in front of his dad was exactly what I had said to the kids. I had said to the kids, when someone's online, you don't talk to them if you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. And he said, I did it. This is what he told his dad. I did this to teach the children a lesson about not talking to strangers online. That's what he told his father. And I said to him, that's not true. And I said it just like that. I said, I know that this is hard for you to, to take responsibility for, but what you just said is not true. What you said was what I said to the class. I said, and that's not your job to teach the class how to handle strangers in a chat room. Your job is to be in the chat room and be a productive member of that chat room. Mm -hmm. It's not what you're saying. And he had nothing to say anymore because I told him you're lying. I didn't say you're a liar. I didn't call him a name. I didn't. I just said, what you're saying is not true. And here's how I know it's not true. Eventually what we did is I called his dad and said he needs, cause what he was now doing in the class was he was lying to all the kids and saying, I don't know who that was. And they would say, why aren't you using the computer? And he would say, oh, I wanna give you a chance to use the computer. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh no, 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 this is not going to happen. Um, I needed him to take responsibility. So I called the dad and said, I just want you to know, I'm not accepting this anymore. He needs to own up to it. And we had another meeting about it. And I said, we, the whole class had a meeting and I said, you know, this child has something to say to you all. And he said, it was me. And they were mad at him. And he, you know, he heard from them and he, but he handled it. And I was mm -hmm. there with him and I helped them. I helped them use language properly to address the situation instead of saying i can't believe you did that you're, you're so horrible you're a horrible person you know that's not the way we talk in this we don't talk like that in this class um so i helped them use the language and so that's so you when we had talked you had come up with like group discussions and and i think the, this kind of leads into that your first group discussion uh question um, which was think, think of your most ch challenging student. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if this would be a good time to try to involve the people who are here to, to do that. I think that would be great. Like those, so those of you that are here, if you can think of your most challenging student, the student you think is not going to get this, the least empathetic student you can think of, and, and tell us the situation and we'll see if we can figure out how, how to handle that in the classroom. Because I have dealt with, um, I was the, the um, inclusion teacher for ever <laughs> in school. Uh -huh. So even though I had the gen ed class, I also had a lot of special ed children in the class. Um, and, and I've had spectrum children in my classroom forever like before we even had that label i look at that i look back at it now and know that that's what it was but those are those are children who are exceedingly difficult to teach empathy they just don't have that innate ability but they can be taught and so let's talk if if someone has if someone wants to come in and talk about your most challenging child and tell us about your most challenging child, and then we'll see what we can come up with. And I can even start if you. I have, um, if you like. Sure. Okay. So it's not in the classroom, but I have a nephew um, who um, basically does not identify with other people at all. And at this time, he was probably around nine or ten years old. I believe he's on the spectrum. Um, and an example was when um, uh, there was a wedding 
and the wedding had had these little um, bowls where they had a, a goldfish in each bowl. And he went to, and it was outside and he went around and he emptied out all the bowls and, you know, when, you know, just basically threw the water and the goldfish on the ground for all these bowls. So it's like, <laughs> um, so that was really the issue, you know, that's kind of the triggering issue, but there, you know, I mean, he'd done other things also. So I don't know. So why, um, how would you walk me through dealing with him? Okay. Or is, or is that too big an issue? No, no, actually I'm thinking that so that's like a perfect example. So one of the things that's great about people and children on the spectrum is that they follow rules. You tell them a rule, they follow the rule. You might have to remind them a couple of times before they learn it, but they follow rules. So what would have been perfect was for his parents to say to him before they went to the wedding, the rule at the wedding is you sit with your hands in your lap until we tell you otherwise, or you sit at your at the table and you don't leave your seat or you know like you you lay out the rules mm -hmm. and so it, so as soon as he got up to go to the first fishbowl his parents could have said to him remember the rule was you sit in your seat mm -hmm. until we tell you you can get up mm -hmm. and that's it um in the classroom and and for him because they're his parents you tell them why, mm -hmm. always say why. You're gonna sit in your seat because when you go to a wedding, it's not about you. That the center of the wedding should be the bride and the groom. And we want them to be the center of attention. So we don't want any attention brought on us, brought on you, brought on anybody else. That the bride and the groom should be the center of attention at a wedding. And mm -hmm. so you're going to behave so that you don't bring attention to you. Oh, I like that. Mm. And, and that's, and remember, it's about empathy. And you can't say to him, have empathy for the bride and groom, but you right. can teach him. The bride and groom are the center of attention. That's it. You're not, they are. Good. Okay. And there's some great comments. So I'm just going to, so uh, maybe we can discuss these as well. Uh, Cheater Paul first was, um, and you brought this up in this example, the role of the parent is equally important as that of the teacher to teach children to develop empathy for each other. And so I'm wondering as a teacher, how well, how much do you work with the parents? Oh, con uh, constantly, constantly. Um, when I taught m my um, my meetings with parents, including parent-teacher conferences, always included the child. I did not have meetings with parents without the child. Mm -hmm. And and we talked about everything. We talked about um, the good and the bad in front of the parents. The child basically ran the conference mm -hmm. um, because it's not my education. And it's not the parents' education, it's the kids' education. And so the kids should be there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm, I'm very glad, Chitra, that you have said that your, your son has a high degree of empathy for other people because I've had, I've had kids on the spectrum like that. They have very high empathy, but they don't put it in place. They don't use it when other people are around. And so you have to sort of remind them, this isn't about you. This is about someone else right now. I, I had a child in my class um, who, when he got angry, which was often, when he got angry, his immediate reaction was to say, I wanna kill you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. That was his response to being angry. He would say it to children, he would say it to teachers, he would say it to anybody who was around, his parents. Mm -hmm. And when you say that in school to a teacher, they take that very seriously. Um, you know, he, he can get suspended for that. Mm -hmm. um, what I taught him was, 
you're allowed, and remember, I said this earlier, you're allowed to think whatever you want. Mm -hmm. It can't come out of your mouth. And so what I taught him was, here's a journal. When you get angry at someone, you're going to go to your notebook and you're going to write down because he, it, what I did first was I said, when you're angry with something, come talk to me first and we'll come up with the words you can use to, to handle the situation. So you're angry at another child, come to me, we'll talk about it. And then you can go back and I'll help you deal with, I'll help you handle that situation. The problem was he wanted to talk to me in the middle of lessons, in the middle of everything. So right. I gave him a notebook and I said, when you get upset about something, you get the notebook, write in it what you're upset about. And he would write it like time, day, you know, the whole thing. This is what happened. And then he put the notebook on my desk. And then when we had time, I would go and read the notebook and we'd talk together. And it worked beautifully because what he wrote in his notebook was, you know, at this time, Mrs. Parisi said, blah, blah, blah. And this made me angry and I want to kill her. And I'm going, you know, all this. Mm -hmm. And then by the time we got to the notebook, he wasn't so angry anymore. And I could say to him, I understand that you were very angry because I was telling you, you had to move your seat or because I was telling you, you know, we weren't, we were changing the schedule, whatever it was that, mm -hmm. that set him off. So and and this is kind of related to what Chitra Paul put down. Were you reading that? Um, you know, I'm a parent of a teenager on the spectrum and not a teacher. So I don't have the experience teaching children. However, my experience with my son has been that of him being someone who has a high degree of empathy for other people. Right. I feel he could have developed it because of all the reading we have done together. As Lisa had mentioned, reading is such a wonderful tool to get children to develop empathy. I'm going to tell you, um, who was that? Chitra? I'm going to yes. tell you, Chitra, he did not develop it because of all the reading you did. He developed it because of the conversations you had with him around the book. So good for you. Bravo. Because that's exactly how to develop empathy, is you have conversations around this. Imagine what that would be like if that were you. Imagine how it would feel if you were the child that everyone was making fun of in class. Imagine how it would feel if you were the child who got lost in the mall or whatever the book, you know, whatever the story was about. Imagine if you were the bear who, you know, and Berenstain Bears, whatever, whatever it was. Um, the, it's about the conversations you have and they, can, they do have a high degree of empathy. This child that I was telling you about with this notebook, if I said to him, look at what you just did, you just made so-and-so cry by saying that, he would get really upset. And he would go over to that person and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I wanted to teach him not to say it to begin with. Think it in your head, think all the mean thoughts you want, but, but that's not what you say. This is what you're gonna say instead, because then you won't have someone crying and it hurts people's feelings and we don't want to do that. Now, and Santi has had a few um, posts also here in the chat where she said that she works with um, some special needs students and many of them are highly empathetic. But what she, what Santi finds is that very often it's the teachers who are not empathetic to, and not challenging these special ed students. And that's where assertion comes in. <laughs> okay. And there we have assertion. We have to teach our children to stand up for themselves. One of the things that I used to do, um, and I'm assuming, Santi, that in your school, you have other teachers. You're talking about teachers in your school who are not empathetic. One of the things that I used to do in my school is when I had children who um, had um, achieved goals. Lisa was mentioning about the teachers in the mainstream school who lacked empathy towards special needs, not in the special school. I worked for a mainstream school in between where uh, teachers could not accept the students and they've been constantly reminding to send them back to special school. So that so, was challenging. So one of the things that I always did, and I'm sure you could still do this, I, when, when one of my students had achieved a goal, 
I don't care what the goal is, moving from one level to another, or even though they're five levels below where they're supposed to be, whatever the goal was, I would take that child with me and go to their special ed teacher, to the reading teacher, to the principal of the school, to the secretary, and we would celebrate whatever it was that had happened. If I had a child who did something unbelievably special for another child, like one of my special ed kids was incredibly empathetic and caring and, you know, like someone, someone's paper got destroyed. And so they redid the whole thing. I would take that, that child around and say, look at what so-and-so did. Isn't this amazing? And the reason you want to take the child is because no teacher in front of a child is going to say, yeah, that's garbage. Who cares? They'll say it to you, but they won't say it in front of the child. And basically what you're doing is modeling for the teacher mm. the way things need to be. Because as this slide that's here shows, we teachers do the wrong thing all the time, all the time. You know, we patronize the kids instead of being honest with them. We say something and then sort of laugh about it or wink at them. Or, you know, we just, we do the wrong things all the time. And we need to learn too. So by you taking that child around and saying, look at how wonderful this child did and look at what this child did and look at what's going on. You, what you're doing is demonstrating to your teachers what they should be doing. There's, um, there's an interesting thread from um, Frederica um, also that talks about the um i'm trying to say you know race racism recoveries for ours um i only actually see three r's the um respect resist repair so there's probably a fourth a reinvent um are you familiar with that at all and is that something that we could be using with students i'm looking at it now this is new to me okay Respect, racism recoveries, respect, resist, repair, reinvent. I mean, I, I'm going to tell you that um, I was just talking to my mom about this as I was coming over. Um, as I was driving here, she was driving with me. And um, for those of you who don't know about it, you should look into Teaching Tolerance magazine. Um, the Teaching Tolerance magazine is put out by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And um, I've, been, I've been getting, it's, a, it's all free and they have free um, curriculum guides to go with movies about bullying and about the march, the children's march and about the, mar the hundred man march. I mean, the million man march. They have um, amazing, amazing things for free for teachers, but their magazine Teaching Tolerance is a monthly magazine, or actually I don't know if it's monthly anymore, I think it comes out like three times a year, um, that they send to teachers and it has articles about how to deal with racism and how to deal with differences and how teachers can do that. Um, so I've been doing this for, I mean, I've been following the Southern Poverty Law Center and Teaching Tolerance. Oh, good. I love Teaching Tolerance. Sorry, favorite, favorite. I've, I've actually been published in it. I just have to say that I wrote an article wow. and it was published. Um, but anyway, um, they what they do is incredible. And one of the reasons we need to teach empathy, and I said I wasn't going to get political. <laughs> So I'm, I'm only gonna say this and then I'm not gonna get political, I'm not gonna be political anymore. But one of the things, one of the reasons we have to look at empathy today is because our, our politicians are destroying, destroying any chance we have to be civil in this world. In this, it's certainly in this country, but I see it happening around the world. I mean, there there's fighting going on where there hasn't been fighting in years and years and years. and and it needs to stop. We don't know how to be respectful and empathetic and caring anymore. We don't know. Mm -hmm. And as I said at the beginning, we're teaching the leaders of the world. 
if we can teach them to be empathetic, we can stop racism. We can stop it because you can't be empathetic to somebody and hate who they are based on their race, their sex, their gender, their, like you, you, yeah. you know, there's like, there, you, you have to do better. And, and Frederica, if, if you want to post a link, if you have a link, because you said that this is your formulation, yeah. um, if you can post a link to that in the chat, then we could all um, follow the link, you know, after, after the session, and I can post that link as well in the, in the, you know, in the archives, because that's a really interesting. Well, for right now, um, teaching tolerance is, is, is really a great source. I'm still developing my work. Okay. Well, I we'll, love teaching tolerance. Yeah. <laughs> and the Southern Poverty Law Center has a lot, a lot of curriculum guides based on movies they put out and they have posters you can put up in your classroom. They have, I mean, they have a me and it's all free. It's all free for teachers. And I'm gonna, so uh, I'm looking at the time but I also see a comment from Anna Palm um, and it, you know, cause we'd asked for an example. And so her example is a child who's mildly autistic and who's having a difficult time with learning now cl and class now being online and seems to be acting out. Um, and uh, Anna Palm is running, we suggested the parent, that the parents allow him to talk to his friends after the classes. And they did that. The thing seems okay for some time, but he returns to the same behavior. Okay, so uh, my question is, is anyone asking him why? Um, you know, like, it, what is he trying to gain? What is he gaining from that behavior? Um, if if what he's getting is a, is the attention that he's missing, then he needs to get the attention some other way. But he, but he needs to be asked, like, why are you doing this? What what are you getting from sending these disturbing messages? Because what's going to happen is you're going to lose friends, and if that hasn't happened yet, it will. Um, and, and so if your goal is to lose your friends, how about just don't be friends with them anymore. But if you're, if your goal, and I'm sure that's not his goal, <laughs> it's not usually the goal, but it will happen. Um, and I've had, I had, I wrote a blog about that actually about a child who was losing friends in the class cause she was a bully. Um, and then she was going home and telling her mom, everyone's bullying me, but she was the bully. And that's why she was losing friends. And she didn't understand why she didn't have friends. I'm like, you, you can't talk to people like this and you can't act like this and then expect to have friends. He needs to be talked to like that. And, and, and that goes back to what we were saying about being honest with kids and being authentic with children instead of putting on that fit. You know, like we're always so concerned about, we don't want to hurt a child's feelings. So we don't want to say this. Somebody needs to call this child out and say, you can't do this, why are you? What are you trying to gain? What, what is your goal for sending disturbing messages? And it seems to me that it, when a child is doing something like this, it's often because that child sees no other way of reacting to a situation. And so to the extent that we can get that child into a more creative mode, to start imagining other ways to act and then choosing one of those that's more likely to give the, the result that the child wants, we may be A, stopping the problem and B, giving the child another way to cope for future problems. And, and that ultimately is our goal as teachers. You know, our job as teachers, when we're teaching about empathy, which is what we should be doing all the time, our job is to teach them the way to talk, the way to handle situations, and to teach them when you have a situation and you don't know how to deal with it, ask for help. Even ask the person who's frustrating you. Say to that person, I'm so frustrated by what you're doing right now, I don't know how know what to do. You know, like, like, I can tell you, I've said to my husband before, and I, you know, I've been married for a long time. I've been married for 35 years. 
And I've said to him, right now, I really just want to smack you across the face. So you have to help me not do that. Because <laughs> we don't hit each other. But especially when we, you know, we're together 24 seven now, like I, sometimes I just want to kill him, but I don't really. And I don't want, I don't want a divorce and I don't want to hurt his feelings, but he's bugging me and I don't know how to fix it. And so sometimes you just have to say to somebody, why, why are you doing that? What are you hoping to gain? Um, and, and let me help you find a different way of doing it. Even, even if the way to help is I'll sit with you while you have that conversation. I used to do that with children all the time. Like they would come to me and say, I'm having trouble with this teacher, this music teacher, this art teacher, this whatever, the reading teacher. And I would say, do you want me to sit with you? Sometimes it would be their parents. I'm trying to tell my mom this, do you want me to sit with you? And the reality is when I sat with them, I never opened my mouth ever. It wasn't my conversation to have that I was really just there as a reminder to the children that there's a better way of dealing with this than crying and screaming and yelling and being angry. Um, and I'm and thinking that, you, there's a lot of, there's a few more slides. Do you want me to advance the slide? Oh. Do you want to talk to a slide? Because this has been cool because we've been at, you know, um, having some really interesting conversations, but um, there's only a few minutes more, so. Well, I just, I just want to point out that if you look at slide, if you'd go to slide four first. Okay. Back to slide four, we already looked at this. Mm -hmm and see the steps to teaching empathy. And then if you go to slide five, hmm. the same steps are there. How do you teach that student? The same way you teach empathy to everyone else. You just do it more, more frequently and more specifically. But we teach that child, that student that drives you crazy, that that you think will never learn. We do it the same way over and over again. We model, model, model. We teach the language of empathy. We say to them, let's sit down and talk about how are you going to say this? And I have said to children who have said to me, well, I'm gonna say blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, you're not. Because let me tell you what I just heard you say. What I heard you say was this, and I don't think that's what you meant to say. One of the um, things I teach in the language of empathy is to start by repeating, when you're having a discussion with someone, you repeat what they said back to them and then add your own thought. So you'll start by saying, okay, what I've heard you say is that you're upset with me because I am using, up your, using your desk as well as mine. And the reason that I'm doing that is because, or I want you to know the reason I'm doing that is because of whatever. Mm. Um, by, by, by stating somebody else's view first, you're acknowledging that they have a view. <laughs> right, and, that's, and that, oh, that's so important. And that you hear it, I hear you, I hear what you're saying. I don't necessarily agree with you, but I hear what you're saying. It also slows down your brain so that you don't blurt out the first thing that you wanna to say to them is, what are you, an idiot? Do <laughs> <laughs> You don't really believe that, do you? Um, it slows down your thinking. So that's the language of empathy. I'm gonna repeat what, I'm, what I have to say to you and then I'm gonna say what I wanna say. Or I'm gonna think about you first before I think about myself. And just one of the things that I tend to use is um, is when talking about a, either a potential behavior or a past behavior to come back and say, well, what are three other ways that you might be able to handle, might be able to do to handle that situation? And then once they've come up with three other ways, then it's possible. And then they're in a more creative mode. And it's like, so now that you have what you what you're thinking of, now you have three other ways which do you think is more likely to get to your end goal and why? And so very often 
uh, almost never do they come to the conclusion that what they were first thinking of doing or what they first did was the one that was going to get them closer to their goals. Right. And, and I had meetings all the time. And if something really big was going on, we would stop whatever we were doing and having a meeting. Otherwise, we would have meetings at the beginning of the year. We had them every single day and then it would go to once once a week um, unless there was something necessary. But when a kid had a problem, we would bring it to the class and say, OK, so and so, you know, Mitch is having a problem here. He doesn't know how to handle this. What can we say to him? And I'd open it up to the other students. So everybody would give him, well, you can try this. Well, you can try that. Well, you can try this. They would, they would have these arguments, these discussions with each other about the problem. It, that did two things. One, it gave the child who was having the problem solutions. It also helped the other children be more empathetic. <laughs> oh, Mitch, I get that every time you go to the computer room, you have a problem there. Now I'm going to help you. I'm going to sit with you when you go to the computer room next time so that I can help you. So you don't have to feel like you're alone in the computer room. So I now have empathy for your, for you and your problem. And I helped you solve the problem mm -hmm. yourself. Interesting. Okay. And then the other, uh, other slides. Yes. So I think the, the only other one is what will you change? Ah. So, so what are you going to change people who are here that's the ultimate question we have to change what we're doing what we're doing is not working <laughs> um we have to do better and so did anyone hear anything that that is gonna help well, them personally i'm gonna think more of modeling i'm gonna think more of before i do something how am i modeling the behavior that i really want others to exhibit and that's the change. That's the first change that I'm going to do. It's the hardest one. Modeling is the hardest one because, and I can tell oh, then, you. I'm sorry. Can you give me an easier one then? I don't want to start on the hard <laughs> one. <laughs> I can tell you for me, I, I'm a very sarcastic person. Sarcasm is horrible. It is horrible. It is, it is nasty. It's rude. It's, it's demeaning. And, and there is no place for it in the classroom. It was very hard for me not to do that, to go, oh yeah, great job. Good job, Mitch, way <laughs> to go, so happy for you. Um, I, it just, you know, uh, like that to me, it's sort, of, it's sort of like language, you know, one of the things that I stopped doing is calling my students guys um, because it was pointed out to me one time well, we're talking like 25 years ago that guys only covers half the class. And, um, and you know, learning to model that behavior, like telling my kids don't call each other guys is one thing, modeling it, totally different. Yeah. And so I, so I had the kids help me. And when you're learning this, have your students help you. Tell them what you're doing. Tell them why you're doing it. Have them help you with it. It's kind of, and I think it was Gandhi who said, be the change you want to make. Be the change you want to see in the world. Thank you. My favorite quote. Um, yes, that's actually uh, something I used to write in kids' um, yearbooks. <laughs> be the change you want to see in the world. Um, yeah, like we have to be better. And if we're better, they'll be better. If we're authentic and, and honest with them, that will help. And everybody here can get in, in touch with Lisa um, on Twitter. Uh, you should follow her on Twitter, um, on Facebook, uh, and take a look at, um, you know, at Lisa's two blogs, uh, Lisa's well, Lingo, one, which, which is really cool. It, it yeah, doesn't really one is a blog. Lisa's mm -hmm. Lingo is my blog. The web node site is my, um, my site for work it's for what i'm doing in work but um but the blog is where i'm posting and, I, and what i have on my blog right now i've been posting a series of blogs on empathy on teaching empathy so if you take a look at that you can see you know what kind of work i'm doing
And I'd also say, you know, you can bring Lisa either actually or virtually into your school to work with uh, your administrators, your teachers, or your kids, right, Lisa? Yes, yes, I love talking about this. And, and Frederica, I cannot wait to see what you're working on because it looks amazing. Yeah, um, Frederica, you know, reach out to both of us because I'd like to I'd like to learn more about it as well. It really looks fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay, and I think we're we're actually six minutes past our time. <laughs> I'm going to stop the share. And uh, Frederica, thank thank you. Uh, Lisa, um, it was great talking with you. Every, you know, I just, I really enjoyed learning from you. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was great. And everybody else, hope to see you at another EdChat Interactive or online. Uh, take care and have a great rest of the weekend. Bye. Bye.